there we go. So this presentation gives you an overview of uh, some of the most frequently used file types in bioinformatics related to next generation sequencing. So the file types we will discuss will be uh, the FASTA file. Uh, you've already seen a bit of it. So that, that's just a uh, file to store, for example, genomes, but uh, nucleotide sequences in general, also amino acid sequences can be stored in a FASTA file. Then the FASTQ file, that is where sequence reads are stored. So usually you store then the actual uh, sequence of that read together with the base quality and that's stored in the FASTQ file. Then the sum slash BAM format, so that's where you store the alignment. So we will spend quite a bit of time on that because it's important and it's not super uh, easy to understand at first what's all in there. There's really a lot of information in there, but you have to understand a little bit how that works. The BAT file, which is a relatively simple file specifying regions in a genome, for example. GFF file or GTF file stores annotations and the VCF file stores variants. So the GFF file has, for example, the positions of different genes and transcripts in there, VCF, uh, for example, SNPs and indels. So a FASTA file um, is one of the most simple uh, file types and most frequently used file types in bioinformatics. So it stores a plain sequence, uh, ends with .fasta or .fa, can store both nucleotides and amino acids in there. Uh, and it looks like this, what you see on the bottom right of the slide. So it's, uh, the title starts with a greater than sign and you can, uh, can have any kinds of characters in there. And then there's a new line, so an enter and then a sequence. And then you can have multiple new lines with sequences. And uh, only if there is a line starts with a new greater than sign, a new sequence uh, starts. So you can have multiple sequences stored in a fast file. A very useful command that uh, at least I very frequently use for a fast file is grab minus C. So grab find strings in a file, in any file. Minus C means counts. So you count the number of matches. And uh, this little part over here means if the line starts with a greater than sign. So what this uh, command reports is the number of sequences or at least titles in a FASTA file. So that can be quite convenient to quickly have a bit of an overview of what's in, of what's in your FASTA file, at least how many sequences there are in your FASTA file. Um, so I think most of you have um, seen a FASTA file before and have a pretty good idea of what it is. Then the FASTQ file. FASTQ file um, contains of uh, records of uh, usually sequence reads, and each of these records contains of uh, four lines. First line is the title of the sequence read, and in the title you can store quite a bit of information for Illumina data that is typically, for example, where the spot was on the flow cell, um, among others, and also you usually store the barcode in there, more on the title in the slide after this. Then the actual cold basis, so the nucleotide sequence, um, then usually an empty line starting with a plus. Um, that line is there probably for uh, backward comp compatibility. So when the FASTQ file was designed, uh, people thought that would have been a good idea to use that line, but nowadays it's not used very frequently anymore. So it, con it contains room for an optional uh, description. And then the fourth line, that's uh, also an important line, uh, stores the base quality. So what you want to do in a FASTQ file is to store the quality of each base that is called in our nucleotide sequence. But if you remember well, uh, very, um, our FRET base quality ranges, for example, from zero to about 40. So sometimes that quality is a single integer, so some, something between zero and nine, or it's uh, an integer consisting of two numbers, so somewhere between 10 and 41, for example. So if you would store these integers together with uh, our nucleotide sequence, that would become a little bit of a mess. So people uh, thought of a way on how to uh, store that in a more, in a smarter way, 
And that's by uh, storing these integers actually, actually as an ASCII character. So that means that each ASCII character represents a certain integer. So in this case, for example, a exclamation mark uh, represents a zero, a semicolon represents 26, an add time 31, an I 41, for example. Or not, for example, that's how it's usually stored in a FASTQ file. So that mean, means, for example, the A over here is a B. And maybe somebody can tell us what kind of base quality that would be, what kind of base quality we have for this A over here. It would be three. 33. Yes, exactly, 33. So we go to so the add time is 31, then the A would be 32, and the B would be 33. So we have a slash over here. So the second base has a bit of a lower quality. I was really have to count what it is, but it's somewhere at uh, looks like 12 or so. We have a smaller dense time, so then T would be 27, and so on. So that's how base qualities are stored in the FASTQ file. Uh, then the FASTQ header contains usually quite a lot of information that can also be relevant to you. Um, for example, or for example, what it usually contains is a first part uh, that depicts the position on the flow cell and the actual the instrument and the run, the flow cell identifier, the lane and the tail within the lane and the coordinates within the tail. So that exactly depicts the position of the spot in which run on which machine. So you can always trace back where your read came from. Uh, as a second part, uh, there is information about uh, which read uh, it was in a pair. So if it's a one, it's the forward read. If it's two, it's a reverse read. But it's filtered out, yes or no. That's not used very frequently anymore. So you, in principle, you can store a FASTQ file and then use this uh, second part of the second part, the second part of the second part of the entire title to store whether you want to filter out the read yes or no, but it's not used very frequently. Uh, control bits also not used very frequently, but there is also at the very end, the barcode. And that's also uh, a very relevant uh, part of information that you often store in your FASTQ title. So that is uh, the identifier of the, of the sample. So the barcode related to the sample that you have sequenced. I have a question for you. Start a new share and try to find my. Browser. There we go. So, question. There's a bit of more of a technical question, but it's also related to how these base qualities are stored in the FASTQ file. So what we have learned uh, in, the, in the previous slide is with grab minus D uh, and then a uh, carrot created enzyme, you can count the number of sequences in a fossil cell because you're just counting the lines that start with a created enzyme, which is typical for the FOS8 titles. In principle, you could also say, okay, uh, the title of the FOSQ file, so with all this information about the, this, um, the position uh, on the sequencing lane, uh, so always start with an add time. So we can also use uh, grab minus D and then not the line starting with a greater than time, but with an add time to call to uh, calculate the number of lines in a FASTQ cell. Why is that not going to work? Okay, so most of you have answered uh, the add time can also occur elsewhere in a FASTQ cell. And indeed, that's the correct answer. The add time is not, not special for a regular expression. You can just use it directly in a regular expression. And uh, there is no specific start to the voice, also not true. It always starts with an F time. So if I go back to the presentation, and if we just go to the previous slide, so the example of our FASTQ file, so we have our title that always starts with an F time. So in principle, you could start counting the number of uh, um, titles with lines starting with an F time. However, as you can see over here is that the add sign is actually one of the ASCII characters that can be used to specify base quality. So let's say if this A 
would have a base quality of 31, then this line would also start with an S time. Well, it's not a title, but it is the line for the base quality. So you would count extra lines there. Usually you have really millions of reads here for SQL files, so it's very likely that at least one or few of the reads um, start with a base with a base quality of 31. So you would count them as an individual record, which would not be correct. So therefore you cannot use that line of code to count the number of reads in a FOSQ file. You've seen yesterday that we have been counting the number of reads in a FOSQ file, but we just did that by counting the number of lines because we know that each record consists of exactly four lines. So we just take the number of lines in our FOSQ file, divided by four, and we have our total number of reads in the FOSQ file. I see something in the chat appearing. So Gabriela tried to grab uh, add signs in a dot file and give zero as output. And that's because like, it's like, quite likely that there are no add signs in a fast, fast A file, of course. They will be in a fast Q file. All right, then the SUM format. SUM stands for sequence alignment format, and the aim is to store alignments, obviously. So the SUM file um, is like many other files in bioinformatics, just a regular text file that starts with a header and then there's a tab delimited part. And the header already contains quite a bit of information and it's quite nice to have, have a bit of an idea of what, what kind of information is stored in there. So for a SUM file, the header lines always start again with an add sign. So uh, you will see later on that other file types, for example, start with a hash sign, but some headers start, all the lines start with an add sign. And uh, different type of informations are, are stored there. So you have these different tags. So we have HD, and that gives you uh, basically, I don't know where HD exactly stands for, but something like head. So it gives you a version name of the sum format. and uh, information about how it is sorted and that's already relevant information because if you do an alignment then the sorting of your alignments are according to the uh, order of the fastq file that you use as as input however usually you are mostly interested not so much in the order of the uh, reads but uh, as that was used as input but the order according to their position on the genome so if you see over here that it's sorted by coordinates, then the reads are not sorted according to the order in the FOSQ file, but their position on the genome. And you will learn later on how to be able to actually do that. Then there are uh, usually quite a few lines um, describing the reference genome to which uh, your reads were aligned. Um, each chromosome or each individual contact has a new line in the sum header. We're now looking at the E. coli reference genome and the E. coli reference genome in our case has only a single chromosome. So that chromosome has a certain name and a certain length and that's uh, stored over here. If you have multiple chromosomes, you have multiple chromosome names and multiple chromosome lengths stored over there. Uh, and then another very frequently used part of the sum header is the at PZ tag and that is uh, information about which programs were run on this sum file in order to come to the sum file as it is right now. So usually you can have multiple programs doing different uh, calculations on your sum file. In this case, we only have um, information about the aligner that was used. So with this FPG tag, we can figure out what kind of options were used um, for the aligner. So what we see over here is uh, this program we used is called Pro, uh, Bowtie. The version even of the is stored. And then the individual the, or the original um, wrapper command is actually written over here and the different, um, the, the, the index and the reads are specified. So the entire command is stored in your sample, which is quite nice because if you, for example, receive a sample from a colleague, 
and you have no idea uh, where it's from and what the history is, you usually can figure it out by just looking at the PG tags in the header. Then after the header, the tab delimited part starts. And the tab delimited parts consist of multiple columns um, of specific information regarding uh, the alignments. Each line uh, represents a single alignment, usually a single read. Um, first column specify the read name. So that is exactly the title that it got in the FASTQ file. Then uh, a flag and a flag represents binary information about the alignment. For example, over here you see an integer and that integer represents um, binary information. So whether it's aligned properly, for example, yes or no, or whether it, um, it, it's made, is mapped, for example. How this binary information is converted into a flag and how you can convert the flag back to this binary information, you will see later on. Then the reference to, so let's say the contact or a chromosome to which uh, the read was aligned, the start position of the alignment, um, the mapping quality. So that would be uh, the information that is used of, of how sure you are the mapping position is correct. And then uh, the SIGR string, and that SIGR string, string specifies whether there are matches or mismatches between your reference uh, genome and your read. So how you can read this uh, figure string is like this. So over here we have a read of, uh, I'm not exactly sure how long this read would be. So it's, uh, that's always a bit of calculation, but our read starts with five exact matches, then two uh, deletions. So I think those are deletions in the query. So deletions in the read, so we have you had the aligner deleted the part in order to uh, optimize its alignment. Then again, seven matches, and then three S's, and an S means soft clipped. So three bases are clipped off of the alignment. Based on the start position and the sticker string, you can also define the end position. Daniela has a question. Yeah, sorry, two questions. One, what was again the S? Uh, soft clipped. That means that three bases were soft clipped from the read. Soft? So ignored for the alignment. Ah, ignored. Okay. Yeah. And then the start position is this the start position in the whole genome or in the chromosome? Or... In the chromosome. Okay. Thank you. So the, this read aligned at position 12,513, so base 12,513 in contact or chromosome U. 96.3. Exactly. And then based on the SIGR string and the start position, you know the exact alignment of the read. Uh, I think Gabriela has a question. Yes. Um, I, For me, it's not uh, clear uh, how does it look, for example, um, how the aligner um, can um, figure it out when it's a deletion or a soft clip. I mean, because in both will be like a gap in both is like there is no uh, alignment in, in the mm -hmm. in the query seconds to the reference genome. So how is like they are named a deletion or soft clip? Maybe for me, it's soft clip, this is not very clear. How does it look or how uh, the alignment it will make this? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so what an alignment tries to do is to, is to optimize the alignment itself. So if you allow for soft clipping, that means that the aligner is allowed to remove a part of the read and ignore that while calculating the penalty, the alignment penalty. So if uh, the aligner would say, okay, I'm not going to soft clip, but I'm going to call this a deletion, for example, that would mean that it would add up to uh, the penalty and therefore it might not um, have a significant alignment at that position. So if you tell the aligner, okay, do the soft clipping, so ignore that part completely for the alignment, try to optimize the part that does fit, then that soft clip is just ignored for, for penalty calculation, and therefore you might get significant alignments with soft clipping, while you wouldn't if you would do, if you would not allow for soft clipping, so if you would call that deletion. 
Okay. And what is the difference between soft clipping and hard clipping? Um, I forgot. I would have to look it up. Hard clipping is not used very frequently. Okay. So the alignment, the align aligner, just uh, use more soft clipping because what 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 would be that is soft? It's because less uh, bases were ignored or. So a soft clipping means that uh, the information uh, of the read itself is retained. So for example, what you can do with soft clip bases is you can display them um, in the alignment if you visualize it. And then you can see which reads are exactly uh, clipped off. OK, that is the, the option in IGV when it says uh, for example. see as soft clips. OK. Yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly. Okay. Uh, Sheena has a question. Yes, I was wondering, in our case, we have a reference of only one chromosome, right? So we know that that starting position is of that precise chromosome. If we would mm -hmm. use a reference with multiple chromosomes, do we see which chromosomes were in the reference name, in this case, yeah. or in the starting position? No, so that would be reference. So this is a bit uh, confusing. So you would say, okay, reference means the entire genome. But it, so that's just how it is named in uh, the, the, the sum manual. So reference here means contig. So basically the fast A title. So okay. the thing that occurs after the greater than sign in your fast A file. So if you have multiple chromosome, that would be chromosome name. And then Great. the position in the chromosome. Great. So if you have paired and reads, you would like to store that, of course, as well in your stem file. So which read uh, belongs to, uh, which reads are paired in the stem file. Um, so um, for example, one thing you would like to store is whether the mate, so the other one, uh, the other read in, in your pair is actually mapped to the same chromosome or to the same contig. And of course, usually that's what you would expect, right? If that's not the case, Either something went wrong or uh, your reference is just broken up into multiple contexts. So if the mate is mapped to the same reference, you get an equal sign over here. If it's a different reference or different context, I should say, a different chromosome, then you get the chromosome name uh, over there, over here. Then uh, you get information about the start position of the mate. So you exactly know where uh, it starts. And uh, therefore, you can also calculate the fragment length. Sorry about that. The fragment length. So it, the, that would mean the complete uh, length of the unknown part that you have sequenced. So between, let's say, the first base of read one and let's say also the five prime base of read two to the end of uh, your fragment. So that's also calculated, the total fragment length. Uh, then we get um, the sequence itself that's also stored in the sample. So that's uh, always there. And the base quality string is also stored over there. There we have the sequence and the base quality and the optional tags that depends very much on the alignment you are using, what kind of information is stored over there. So that's basically extra information related to the alignment. So then a few words about Sigur strings. Um, so uh, the, 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 the letters that are most frequently used are the M, the I, the D, and the N, and also the S. So the first five. So the M uh, specifies a match, the I an insertion, uh, to the reference. So in addition, you have something inserted to your read. A deletion is a deletion from the reference. So it is deleted in your read. An N is skipped for, from the reference. And that is actually used for, for example, uh, specifying intronic or uh, spliced alignments, I should say. So if you then you skip an, an entire intron, uh, that's specified by the N. And then the, and then the F is used for soft clipping. However, what you can also store, what you see, for example, at the end, so this number seven and eight, is a sequence match 
and a sequence mismatch. So in principle, you could store in the sticker string also individual SNPs. So if you have a mismatch between your reference and your read, for example, in your reference, you have an A, in your read, you have a G at that position, you can specify in uh, the uh, sticker string, uh, for example, an X. However, this is actually stored as an M in the uh, sticker string. So these are almost never used. And that has a reason. So let's say, uh, this is what I just explained. So let's say your reference is over here. And uh, so on, on the bottom and your alignment is at the top. So you can say, okay, we have seven matches. So that's how it's actually stored. But you can also say, okay, I have three sequence matches, one uh, mismatch, and then three sequence matches again. So we have a longer sequence string, but we have stored information about this variant over here. So the reason for that is that um, also the read itself is stored. So the sequence of the read itself is also stored in the SOM file. That would mean that if you would store these mismatches in your secret string, you would store the same information basically twice. Because you have the read information, so the actual base, uh, the basis, and you also have the reference information. That means that if you would store uh, those individual mismatches in your sticker string, you would store information about a mismatch twice, both in the reference and the actual read and in the sticker string. And people said, okay, we're not going to store um, information twice. So uh, we are going to say, okay, if there is a single uh, mismatch, meaning for example, an, an SMP, we are going to store it as a match and you can figure it out from the read itself where that actually came from or to figure out where the, what the actual nucleotides were in uh, the read. So I have a different question. Uh, mm. in, so yeah. I'm sorry, uh, before you made the question, so it, 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 it means that the mismatch are um, stored as SNPs. The mismatches, they are stored. So in this case, so let's say the axis, they are just um, stored in the read themselves uh, re related to the reference, meaning that you store the actual sequence in uh, the SOM file. So that's what you see over here. So the sequence itself is already stored in the SOM file. And because you know the, the matches and deletions and insertions based on the sticker string, based on the reference uh, sequence and the read sequence, in combination with the sticker string, you uh, can figure out what okay. the nucleotides are that are different from the reference and the read. Okay. Yeah? Okay, so let's go to the actual question I want to answer, uh, to ask you. So now we have a bit of an idea of what the the sum file looks like, what kind of information is stored in there. And let's say you have only uh, the sum file. And my question is whether you would be able to uh, regenerate the FASQ file, so the original FASQ file out of the sum file, or at least the reads that were in the FASQ file. Or, and, or can you generate the reference sequence, so the original FASQ file from the sum file? So only the sum file. We have nothing else. Yeah, most of you have answered. All of you have, at least all of you who are in the poll. So most of you have answered, um, or the most answered uh, answer is only the FASQ file, and that's also the correct one. <clears throat> so indeed, um, you cannot regenerate the FASQ file from the SOM file, but you can generate, regenerate FASQ file. In order to explain that, let's go back to the presentation. So if we look at this step, the limited part of the sound file again. Um, <clears throat> so everything that is in the FASQ file is stored there. So we have the read name that is stored, we have the sequence and we have the base quality. And all of those are stored in the FASQ file. So you could, you can, and it's often actually also done, regenerate the FASQ file from the sound file. So that's pretty good. The Daniela's question. 
But you don't have anything on the instrument information in the sound file. Yeah, so that's that would be the uh, stored in the read name. That's this part. Uh, everything. So I shortened it. Uh, the read name is entire title. Line. Yeah. Uh, okay. Um, so if the information about the reference that is stored is mainly stored in the header, and that's only the context or the chromosomes that you have in reference and their length. Other than that, there, that there's nothing stored in the sound film. So if you want to do, for example, variant analysis, you always require the sound file and the reference genome in order to find mismatches between your reads and the reference. Okay, then about some flags. So these are these the second column in the tab delimited part of the thumb file, and they are stored as integers. And the integer, they are a sum of different bits that specify a certain characteristic, whether that is true or false. So meaning that let's say um, if we look at the third one, so with bit number four, segment is unmapped, means that, for example, your read is not mapped at all, so you couldn't find a place uh, for your read in the genome, it's stored, still stored in the sound file, then you get a four. And let's say you have uh, another characteristic, for example, that your read is paired, uh, so that is Pretty sure that's this one template having multiple segments in sequencing. So that basically means that your read is paired. So if your read is unmapped and it is paired, you get a four plus one. So you get a five at that position. Um, so at that second column in the sound file. So all of these characteristics, these, uh, how many are there? So about 10 or 12, they can be stored in the sum flag. So for example, we can also store in some flag whether we have a PCR duplicate, yes or no, whether it's marked as a PCR duplicate or whether it was the first or the uh, last segment in the template, meaning is it the forward or the reverse read, um, and so on. So uh, how does this work? Uh, I've put together a small example. So uh, let's say your read is paired and it's properly aligned. So the bit uh, that is uh, that specify whether the read is paired is the one, and the bit that specify it's properly paired is the two, so you add them together, so you will get a flag of three. Let's say your read is paired, not properly aligned, and the mate is unmapped, then you get a flag of nine. If your read is paired, um, it is unmapped, and the mate is also unmapped, then you get a flag of 13 and so on. And you can, because we have, we're working with bits, you can always translate back these flags into the individual uh, binary information. Question for you. Sheena has a question. Yes. Um, so this means that actually the points are always the same. So you just go back. So like the read paired is equal to one, give it like a mm -hmm. point to that is always the same. No, maybe um, so if you, uh, so for example, you can also have some files where you combine paired ends with single end reads, for example. Mm -hmm. So then some of the alignments would not <laughs> have uh, this characteristic. So you would not have the one in there. See what I mean? Yes, I don't understand what are the one, two, four, and eight, the bottom. So these are the bits. They are, they are uh, that's basically this table. So this one, two, four, and eight, meaning template having multiple segments of sequencing, that basically, if you translate that, which basically means, was your read paired, yes or no? So that's this okay. one. Okay, so these, these are always the same. Yes. This code is always valid for some flags, right? It's always the same. Yes. If we have yes. this table here, then we are sure that if I have a total of exactly. 32, then I can go back. Okay. Yes. So the two always means uh, each segment is properly aligned. Yeah. The four okay. always means the segment is okay. on that. The read is on that. Thanks. All right. Then uh, a few more um, examples of types of data. 
So we have uh, the BATPAL, and BATPAL stands for Browser Extendable Data. And what it just stores are usually region in a uh, genome. So uh, what it always stores is at least three columns. And the first column would be the sequence title. So for example, contig or um, chromosome. The second uh, uh, column would be the start position of a specific region, whatever a region of interest. And the third column would be the end position. Then you can give it a name. For example, you can store information about exons in there. So in the example, we have exon one, exon two in there. You can uh, store a score for whatever reason. For example, how sure you are there is an exon over there. And you can store the strength. So whether it's in the uh, positive or the negative strength relative to your genome. One thing that is very typical about Bedfell is that the numbering of the uh, start position starts at zero and numbering of the end position is, let's say, standard. So that is inclusive, we call it. So if you would convert it in, for example, a way we also specify regions, starting with the chromosome name, a colon, and a start and an end, you would convert this bed file into uh, regions. So uh, uh, we would specify it typically, for example, also in IDV, we would start at the 1702. Well, in the bed file, it would be 1700. And one. This is, this is a little bit annoying. So this really starts at the 1700 and second base. That's where your region starts. Um, so basically, in a bed, it starts after the specified start sequence. This is a bit confusing, but it is what it is. So some at some point, people have thought, okay, this is what a bed file is, and we just stick to that because every bed file is formatted in that way. Then the GFF file is quite similar to a bed file, but we have some additional information. Um, for example, what kind of feature we are looking at. And GFF files are typically used for uh, storing information about genes, for example, about where transcripts are, where coding sequences are, uh, where genes are in a genome. Uh, it has a few columns. First column is uh, again, the chromosome name or the contact name. The second one is the source, so where the source where the annotation actually comes from. Third one is the feature, so what kind of feature are we looking at? So is that a messenger RNA, is that an exon or coding sequence or whatever? Uh, then we have a start and an end. So the start and the end is um, uh, different from a bed file, if I'm not mistaken. So that would be uh, really starting counting at the one instead of counting at the zero as is common for the bed file. Then we can uh, store a score. So how sure you are that a certain feature was actually there, uh, depending very much on the software you're using, whether you store that kind of information. Uh, the strength, same as bed file, minus or plus trend. The frame, we can uh, store there. So whether uh, the uh, translation of an amino acid actually start uh, at that position or whether that's irrelevant. So if it's missing, so if it's irrelevant, so that would be the case for messenger RNA and exome, um, you get a dot. Uh, the coding sequence, of course, uh, is, uh, you can use that to translate that into a uh, amino, amino acid sequence and then where to start uh, this frame. If it's a zero, it really starts where the coding sequence also starts. And then you get a whole bunch of attributes. Usually that's a pretty, long line of, for example, uh, the, the gene identifier, for example, the ensemble ID, the, the gene symbol, and of course, uh, of also often, for example, the parent. So if you're talking about an exome, the parent would be the transcript. If you're talking about a transcript, the parent would be the gene and so on. And that's also all stored in attributes. So you know which kind of features belong to which. Then the last uh, format I want to discuss, Seba. Uh, sorry, I'm not uh, switching on the video because my uh, Wi-Fi is not good. Sorry about that's that. Um, yeah, so my question was about the difference between the information that's stored in a bed versus a GFF file. 
So was it that in the BED file, it was only about exons, whereas the real annotation of the gene and transcript is coming from the GFF? That's the uh, BED file can store any region. So anything you want to annotate at the genome. So it doesn't necessarily specify exon, but really whatever you want. Then so uh, it could also, for example, specify a promoter region or uh, you know something that is enriched somewhere or Okay, then what additional information is a bed file adding apart from what is already what could already be in a GFF? Well, it's more that um, so a bed file is much more flexible. So you can store anything there. And a GFF file is really there to store information usually about uh, genes. Okay. Genes and transcripts. So okay. in principle, you can store the same information in GFF file, also in a bed file. You can actually convert a GFF file to a bed file. It would have a few additional columns over there, but pretty much for all information that is in a GFF file can also be stored in a bed file. Um, but not everything that can be stored in a bed file can also be stored in a GFF file, because uh, in addition to genes, you can also store, for example, I don't know, primer position, for example, in a bed file. Okay, okay, thanks. And uh, second question is GFF and GTF, are they similar or different? That is a bit of a complex story. Um, they store mostly the same information, but there are uh, multiple versions. So if I, just by heart, I think, so you have GFF, GFF2 and GFF3. Mm -hmm. And I think the GFF, Two is exactly the same as GTF. So that's by heart. I'm not entirely sure whether that's exactly true, but that is how they a little bit relate. So there are GFF versions that are exactly the same as GTF, mm -hmm. but uh, for most applications, you can almost use them interchangeably because the difference in how things are stored are very similar between the GFF versions and GTF as well. Okay, okay, thanks. So then the last <clears throat> file types, that's the VCF. And in the VCF, you store information about uh, variants. So like a song file, a VCF file also has starts with a header, but other than so where the headers, the song file starts with add signs, the uh, header of the VCF file starts with hash, hashtags. Um, and then after that, you again have a tab delimited part. And in this tab delimited part, not alignments are stored, but uh, variants are stored. So basically what you store in a VCF file, we'll go into what is exactly there in uh, later slides, if I'm not mistaken, yes. So we have our reference and we do the aligned reads. And at some point you want to use some software, for example, to figure out whether for example, at this position, you see sometimes a T and sometimes a C, which is the reference, whether that is a variant, yes or no. And that is stored in the VCF file. So what you want in a VCF file is a position. You want information about the reference allele and information about the alternative allele. And for example, also information about the genotype. So the genotype for this position over here with only the Cs is probably homozygous C. In this case, homozygous alternative because it's different from the reference. And at this position, it is heterozygous uh, for the alternative, meaning half of the reads probably or half of your genome is, um, is a C and the other half is a T. So if you're looking at a diploid, then of course one allele is a T, one allele is a C. Um, also, what you want to be able to store in a PCF is, for example, insertions and deletions. So that's also possible. So over here, we apparently have a insertion of two bases. And over here, we, it seems to have a deletion of one base. So probably the P is deleted in the reference. So basically what you what a uh, variant caller does is converting our sum file into a VCF file, specifying specific positions and alleles for our variant. Uh, it looks like this. So we have our header starting with the hashtags. And in this header, there is uh, quite a lot of information. For example, uh, what kind of version we have, the date, 
often also what kind of software was used to create the VCF, not specified in this example over here. Um, <clears throat> uh, and there is information what, about what is specified in the tab delimited part. So the tab delimited part starts with, again, the chromosome name or the contact name, the position, so very similar again to, to other formats. Then we have an ID, an identifier for the particular variant. So if you call new variants, you do not know the ID on forehand. So this is usually then empty. Oh, sorry. Then we have the reference allele at that position. We have an alternative allele at that position. So that's so these are only the positions where we actually call a variant. The quality of the variant in general, whether there's a filter uh, specified over here. So if there's a pass, it is not filled out. If there's a Q10, it is filtered out. There's an info field giving information about the variant as a whole. And then there is also information about particular samples. So you can store information of multiple samples in a single VCFL. And what is stored in these particular samples is stored in the format column, specified in the format column. And then all these different codes we see over here uh, in the, both the info field and the format field, they are described in the header. So we have this part in the header where, we, where info uh, where the info field is described, for example, this NF. So uh, what kind of, uh, how information is stored is there and a description is also stored in there. And over here it says, okay, NS means the number of samples with data. So we can check that in the tab delimited part and we see number of samples with data equals three. Um, and we actually see two columns per samples and that is because this VCFL was a little bit too long for the slides, so I cut off the third sample. But there are three samples in total with data. We also see DP, for example, total depth. So we have a total depth of 14, apparently, and so on. So the VCFL is super flexible, which means that the, the software you're using or the, the end user can decide what kind of information is stored in this info field. Same counts for, for the format field and the filter field, by the way. So first, let's go to the filter. So um, if the filter is not false, then um, you might specify why a certain variant is filtered out. In this case, we see Q10 over here. And the description is that there's a quality below 10. And that's actually what we see over here, that the quality is below 10. So the, again, also the filter can be anything, very flexible. <clears throat> then the format part, the format part describes what kind of information is stored for sample, so not information about the variant as a whole, but what kind of information is stored for sample. And that is what you see over here. So for example, we have genotype, so GP, that is very, that's a very frequent uh, type of information that is stored in the VCF. Oops. Um, and um, so the order of the format column over here should also be, or is always the order of the different characteristics that are stored in each individual column of the different samples. They do not have to be exactly the same for each uh, variant, because for example, for an indel, you might want to store different information than for a, uh, a SNP, for example. So we have the GT over here. So the first part of the column of a certain sample should be the genotype. And the genotype is always specified uh, according to the number uh, of the ploidy level of the organism. So in this case, we are looking at human data. So it's diploid and the numbers in the genotype refer to the reference and alternative. So over here we see zero and then a pipe symbol and then a zero. That would mean that this specific sample is homozygous reference. So the zero always specifies the reference allele, while the one specifies an alternative allele. Sometimes you even have multi-allelic variants. For example, over here where we see the reference is an A and the alternative are a G and a T. They can also even have twos specifying a allele. So the two here specifies the T and the one specifies a G. So in this case, this individual is heterozygous for T and T, and it doesn't contain the reference allele. 
And so you can also store other information, of course, uh, about the specific examples, for example, genotype quality. So how sure the variant color was that the genotype it has called is the actual genotype. Again, this is also in thread based, uh, a thread based core. So it's very similar to mapping quality and base quality. These are examples. That was already clear. That is it in terms of file types. Everything clear regarding that. Um, I have a question. Um, I would like to know, uh, for example, this haplotype quality, uh, what does it mean or what it explains? Um, so there, so PCF files are very flexible. That also means that you can store any information we'd like to store about a certain variant. So haplotype quality can be something that is completely used by only one very specific type of software. For example, uh, software that does haplotype calling, that uses haplotypes. So to understand what haplotypes and everything are, I think that goes a little bit too deep for this course. But you can, for example, link multiple variants together and calculate, for example, a score about how sure you are that the called haplotype is actually the haplotype. So that's probably what this would represent. So whether the haplotype that is called, so haplotype information can also be stored in um, in a PCF. Um, I am not going to explain it now. Um, but uh, so this haplotype quality uh, would be uh, depicting how sure the haplotype color was that the haplotype it reports is true. Um, in the in the um, sample column, which which number is the haplotype quality and which is the read the read depth and which one is the quality genotype quality? Okay, so that is specified in this form of column. So here we see GT, which is genotype quality yeah. or genotype GQ, which is genotype quality, uh, DP, which is read depth, HQ, which is haplotype quality, and in that order, it is reported for the different samples. So we have the genotype quality over here, or the genotype over here, so the zero, zero, the genotype quality over here, so 48 for this sample, uh, the depth, uh, so the read depth one, apparently, and the haplotype quality is 51,51. So there are two haplotype qualities. Uh, I have no idea why. You, you would have two haplotype qualities, but apparently haplotype qualities is reported with two numbers. So you can already notice that haplotype quality is not a very, uh, not a quality that's reported very often. Yeah, because in the, um, for example, in the bottom uh, position, that is only like the genotype, the uh, genotype quality and the read depth, and then yep. the haplotype quality is not reported, no? No, oh, indeed. So because you can report different characteristics for different variants. So in this case, the the variant caller has decided, okay, I'm not going to report haplotype quality over here. And that is because it's not based. So if you see a pipe symbol over here, then a variant is based. So meaning that it's part of an haplotype. If there is a splash, it is not based, so it's not part of a haplotype. So, and because it's not part of haplotype, also haplotype quality is not reported over here. 